All right, I'd like to introduce uh, Mitchell Hashimoto. Uh, he's a developer with uh, KIP, but certainly, well, perhaps not most importantly to him, but to the rest of us, uh, is the developer behind Vagrant, which I think has changed many of our lives over the course of the past year. So uh, yeah, deserves the round of applause, Mitchell Hashimoto. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Is the, is the mic on? Is it good? OK, cool. Um, all right, so good to see uh, all of you here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some advanced Vagrant usage with Puppet today. Um, so there is an advance in the title. So if you don't know what Vagrant is already, or you're in this talk, um, you're either going to learn really fast or you're going to have a bad time. So that's a warning. Um, I'm, he already introduced me. Um, I'm Mitchell Hashimoto. I guess this just has my Twitter handle on it. Um, if you want to tweet at me any questions or anything for later. Um, I made Vagrant, obviously. Hopefully you use it. If you don't, I think you'll like it, so you should. Um, and I can be described kind of as an automation freak. Um, I really, really love to take a look at anything dealing with computers that humans um, do and seeing if I could automate it away. And I think this talk is going to show you just how crazy I get with automation. Um, but I get you know, reasonably crazy. And uh, before I get started, I do want to say that I have hundreds of Vagrant stickers. So if you want a sticker for your laptop or for your coworkers or whatever, then just catch me after the talk, and they're in my bag. And I'm just handing them out for free. So you could get those. All right. So let's first quickly talk about Vagrant usage. And not how to use it, but more on a high level what we want to get out of it or, or why we use it. So um, with a focus on ops, because this is PuppetConf. So we're not going to talk about devs a lot today. Um, so benefits we want from Vagrant. And hopefully you guys saw the keynote today from Paul Strong, because um, he said this perfectly, and so I pulled his words from it. Um, but we basically want the cloud on your own machine, and specifically his definition of the cloud. You want something that's self-service, um, instant provisioning, cost efficient, elastic, and, and you know, pay per use, but that doesn't really uh, apply too much to Vagrant. Um, but yeah, you want something you could use. You want something you could use easily. Um, you want something that doesn't cost a lot of money, so you could use it all the time. Um, and you want something that's flexible. That's, that's a perfect definition. I liked what he said. And so more specifically, what you want out of Vagrant um, in terms of Puppet is um, you want to be able to do uh, manifest module development. And you want to be able to test simple cases, which are you know just basic modules that have some resources that are pretty simple. And you want to test not so simple cases, which would include um, exported resources, um, higher interaction nodes, not just manifest, but actual node testing. Um, what else? Um, inner module dependencies, um, definitions, you know, all that stuff. You want to test all of it. And um, you'd like to be able to do that with something like Vagrant. You want repeatability. So you want to be able to have a process that you could teach, um, educate, you could repeat, um, and you could you know, have some expected workflow that you use. You don't want it to be some ad hoc thing um, you do, like spinning up an EC2 instance manually or something like that. Uh, you want reasonably fast feedback. So this is relative, uh, because you know, Vagrant itself could be relatively slow. But compared to spinning up a new server every time you want to test something, you want something a lot faster than that. And you want confidence. So you want to know that if you're testing your Puppet modules and they converge on Vagrant, you want to be confident that those, that means it'll also converge in production. So here's a confession. If there's some people who have been following talks I've gave or t my tweets or something, um, but I used to be a Chef user full time for like four years. And for the past three to four months, I've been doing Puppet full time. And I, I did Puppet before then, but I didn't do it professionally full time. I just did it enough to support Vagrant users. Um, and so I came to Puppet like four months ago, again, professionally. And I said, you know, what's the current state of Vagrant and Puppet? Like, I know, I know there's integration. I know it works. But like, how are people actually using it? And I saw people doing um, basic manifest development testing, um, a lot of it. You know, a lot of, I need to write an Nginx um, module. And so I'm going to write it. and. Uh, do a Vagrant up and see if it works, and that's about it. Um, and yeah, <laughs> that's like all I saw people doing. 
Um, there were some more, you know, there's a few handful of people that are doing more advanced things, but for the most part, this was the common case. And the thing is, we could do a lot better than that, and we could do much, much better than that. And most importantly, we could do much better than that with tools that are available right now, not things that I need to build, or not things that other people need to build, or anything, just what's available right now, we could do a lot better. And just because I can, just a teaser, with stuff that I'm working on now, it gets a lot more magical and cool, um, but I'm just gonna throw that out there. Look forward to next year. Um, so my state of Vagrant and Puppet over the past four months, where I am today on my day-to-day -day work, what's going on. Um, I have a fully automated Puppet, Puppet Master setup, so I could go from nothing to having a production scalable, at least to a few hundred nodes, uh, production scalable Puppet Master um, by running one command. And I could do that in Vagrant, I could do that in EC2, I could do that on physical hardware, doesn't matter. Um, I'm able to test exporter resources, Hira, and nodes in addition to basic modules. Uh, I have a common deploy process across Vagrant and EC2, so this is getting my modules and everything over to the Puppet Master. It's the exact same process all across the board. There's a repeatable workflow throughout the, the whole the whole process, so the way I test in Vagrant is actually the exact same command I use to kick a Puppet run in production. It's, it's not Vagrant provision, um, it uses Vagrant provision underneath it, but um, I wanted to keep the same workflows. So we'll see that. I do golden master box creation for development. This one's kind of interesting, we'll talk about that. And so that's what I have, and it's, it's time to share what I've learned. I've been doing this Again, like I said, for a few months, it works really well. I'm really happy with it. I showed some people, and, and they were pretty impressed. So I think it's, it's ready, and I, I want to show you what I do. So the title of the talk is Advanced Vagrant Usage. Um, but really, it's not advanced vagrant usage. It's advanced automation for puppet work that happens to use vagrant quite a bit underneath. So we're just going to go through each thing that I do one at a time and talk about how I do it, why I do it, um, and what benefits it gives. So a fully automate, automated Puppet Master setup. This has to be the first thing you do unless you do a masterless thing. Um, so when I first got into the, the, the Puppet full time, I have a lot of friends at Puppet Labs. I emailed someone, I hope, they, they might be here, but I anonymized it anyway. And I emailed them and I said, how do people bring up or recover a Puppet Master? Um, so I see you have packages, um, but you've got to configure it. You need Puppet DB, you need some other things. Enterprise seems to solve um, this with their installer, but I'm just getting started, so I just kind of want to do the open source one. Um, what happens if the master crashes? How do you recover, like, say you're, you're backing up your SSL directory or something. How do people recover that? Is it automated? Um, and the response I got was, most people roll their Puppet Master by hand and then they build on from there, they automate from there. And this is some anonymous Puppet Labs employee. And instant reaction <laughs> for, from the automation person, I was like, no, <laughs> no, no. So, and the reason is the Puppet Master is, is crucial to testing realistic scenarios. Um, you need to be able to bring these things up and down easily. Um, and that's because, well, this is in the wrong order, but if you push broken puppet code, it crashes the server. Um, that usually doesn't happen because people lint, I hope. Um, but it's possible, so you don't want to use your puppet master in production for development um, because that could break. And I don't lint every time. I don't want to lint every time I have to, I just want to test something in development. So I'd rather just have a puppet master I could crash. Like, I don't care. Um, local development against a Puppet Master has a lot of benefits. Namely, you could test things that require a master, like, uh, like exporter resources. Um, and you get automation all the way down. You, you start, since the Puppet Master is the first thing you need anyway, then you start automating there and you automate all the way through. And the way I built this automated Puppet Master bring up is pretty much a multi-level bootstrap process. So at each stage, I want to I mean, ideally what I want is I want to bootstrap a Puppet Master with Puppet, but there's a chicken and egg problem with there, there because you need the Puppet Master to run the Puppet Agent to build the Puppet Master. So instead, you do this, I do this multi-level thing that uses 
the best tool um, at, um, immediately as it comes available. So the first step is a bash script that minimally installs the Puppet Master and Agent. Um, this is literally just add the Puppet Labs repo, app get install, um, and then kick off the next step. Uh, the next step is Puppet Apply, and so this does a masterless um, Puppet run that has its own set of scripts, and this minimally sets up the Puppet Master infrastructure. Um, at this point, you're still not production ready with a Puppet Master, but it's running. Um, this also sets up scripts I use to deploy um, the Puppet code, which is we'll talk about later, but it's basically an rsync. Um, but this sets up those permissions and stuff like that. And then the third step is to do a full-fledged Puppet agent run. And this, um, this runs against the Puppet Master, um, uses your actual production modules and everything. Um, and this also, in our case, we're on EC2, and this, in our case, also will build an EBS volume from an SSL directory backup if it exists, so we could recover all our certs. Um, and so in the case our Puppet Master crashes, I just run one command, this bootstrap runs, and at the end, the Puppet Master restarts, and we have all the old certs. And the result at, at the end of this is you have a production quality Puppet Master whenever and wherever you need it. Um, and when you have that, this, this script, you get a Vagrant config that looks like this. Um, you just use the shell provisioner, and you could then have a Puppet Master on your own machine um, in like five to 10 minutes, depending what kind of machine you have. Um, and that's really the first step to get started with, with anything, since you need a Puppet Master for, for everything. Um, the next thing I do is test exported resources, Hira, and nodes. And again, I emailed the Puppet Labs employee, the same one, and I said, okay, I got a Puppet Master up. It was, I did it. Um, how do people test more than the most basic Puppet module? Like, I, I get the Vagrant provision workflow. I, I mean, I, I built it, so I, I get it. But how do people do things like exported resources and so on? And the response I got was, I suspect the answer is that they just don't test their modules adequately. Um, and again, <laughs> like what? Um, and he, he, it was actually a very long email. He included like Puppet, RSpec Puppet, and some other stuff. And he's like, people do this and that. Um, and I was like, cool, but I actually just want to see if, run it and see if it works. And he was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think people do that. And I was like, well, I'm going to do it. So um, the solution um, is this automated Puppet Master, so building off of what we have earlier and then using Vagrant's multi-VM capabilities. So the automated Puppet Master is production ready. So it has PuppetDB, has Hira, configured like it's in production, it's good to go. Um, and then multi-VM uh, enables Vagrant to manage a cluster of VMs that could communicate together um, all on your own machine. And so you could use this to test things like exporter resources and so on. And so testing exporter resources, um, how do I do this? The basic steps are these. You create two nodes, two Vagrant nodes. Um, you export on one, you collect on another, and you have like a Ruby or shell script, you know, some script that verifies that it worked. Um, the, I end up creating test um, nodes that look like this in Puppet. I have a test exporter and a test collector. The exporter exports something, and um, the collector actually includes a role or you know, production module I use that is expected to collect something. So in this case, the test collector um, is testing our origin server, our CDN origin server, um, which, gets ex which collects exports of Nginx sites that have the tag of origin. Um, and I just want to make sure the test here is that the origin role properly collects these exports. Um, and then I have a variant config that looks like this. Um, I have two VMs. This is multi-VM, so I have two VMs. Um, the test exporter, you can just set the host name straight from the Vagrant file. Um, test exporter, test collector, and I uh, provision using a Puppet server, which is a Puppet master. Um, and I usually run Vagrant with verbose debug, so I could, if something goes wrong, I don't need to rerun it with those. I could just see right away. Um, and then I bring them up. I bring up the exporter, and then I bring up the collector, and then I run some bash script, which could be as simple as this, but could be as complicated as you want. Um, you know, just test that that, let's see if that exporter resources were collected properly on the collector. Um, and again, the test here is not, is just a test that 
some role or some module properly collects something. It's, it's not, uh, this is an isolated test. I test basic things like does it install Nginx properly um, in separate things, and I just use Vagrant provision for that. Um, but for exported resources, I do this sort of thing. And it works really well. It's caught bugs, totally. Um, testing Hira. So Hira, um, of course, you could assume Hira itself uh, works. You could assume Puppet Labs tests that. That's not what I want to test. But the more important is testing that the Hira configuration, the hierarchy that you build, is correct. So if the hierarchy is broken, then the higher parameters it's going to pick up, you know, at the role level, the data center level, or something could be wrong, and you could you could end up with a horribly misconfigured machine. So I want to make sure that it's properly, it's it's loading the right sequence, um, and it catches any configuration problems. So the steps for this is create a full higher hierarchy, matching um, hopefully every step in your higher configuration, launch a node, and test that it inherited them all. Um, this is pretty simple. So you create a bunch of uh, um, YAML or however, I use higher at the YAML, but you create a bunch of higher configs um, that match each level, um, just include test information in it, um, and then you bring up a node that will match those, those things. And then uh, you have a puppet thing like this, so I have a node test Hira that pulls in all the configurations, dumps a file with the results in it, and then I use bash to just compare. And I make, sure, I make sure that those variables always equal the value I expect. And that just makes sure that Hira is reading it in the right order, that all of them are available, it's not forgetting a file, um, and so on. And, and we specifically have Hira um, levels that depend on custom facts. And this also kind of helps test those custom facts are working properly, too. Like, uh, uh, for example, the role Hira, um, we have a fact that just pulls that out of the host name. We use predictable host names. So if we have something named East Postgres SQL 001, the role is going to be Postgres. Um, and this makes sure that that all works. Testing nodes. Um, this one, I mean, this one's pretty easy, but for completeness, I'll bring it up. You just create a node, you provision it, and you do some basic behavioral testing on it. Um, what's more important is I test, um, if you're in the GitHub talk, I guess, um, it's like them. I test on roles. Um, so I don't test individual modules very heavily. I test um, a complete role to make sure it builds something that functions the way I expect. So um, for example, I'll define, I have a Puppet Master and then a node. I'll give it the host name of Postgres. And then I'll run um, a bash script again or something to verify various aspects of that server. Uh, and I don't test, I don't do any exporter resource stuff here. I assume that works from other tests that I do. And that works. Um, one pain point um, with testing nodes, or, or all of this actually, is that no, node destroying up requires a cert clean and a puppet DB deactivate on the master. Uh, you'll see how I kind of, how I made that pain point go away. Um, but that's something you'll run into like instantly. Especially because Vagrant creates the same host names every time. So you'll very quickly just realize you have to do this. And that's how I test those things. Um, next, I have a common deploy process across, for us, Vagrant and EC2, but basically across anything we want. Um, the goal is getting your puppet code to your masters, and this has always existed. So is it a solved problem? Pretty much, yeah. Um, but the goal for me was to make it the same for everything, not. I want a development deployment, even though it's on your own computer, to be the same as production um, and anything in between that we might do, test or QA or, or staging or any other sort of thing. Um, so my solution is on each server, there's a bash script that does the deploy. Um, for production, it does a git pool. For development, it actually uses VirtualBox shared folders, so the git pool is no ops. But um, then it does an rsync and restarts the master. Um, but it, the, the important thing is it's the same across everything. Um, so I use Fabric, and depending where I'm going, I just fab deploy, and then where I want those things to go, and it does. It, it's just an SSH that runs that bash script. It's like oh, I think I. It's like a one-liner. It's like deploy, run that thing. Um, and the cool thing is, we do. We have Vagrant, we have production, and then um, we actually moved our Puppet Masters just to make it easy. Each developer that's working with a Puppet Master has their own Puppet Master in EC2. Um, and they're named dev and then their handle. And 
there's another fab script that creates that for them on the fly. So if they want to deploy to that dev environment, to their dev environment, they just do deploy in the name of it, and it goes there. And it's all the same. If they're, if they're offline or they don't want to work with the EC2 environment, they could do it in Vagrant too, and it's the same. Um, and then the updater script, um, I went ahead and just did this. So it's up at that bit.ly link. It's really simple. We do a git pool. Um, we use special branch naming conventions for Puppet environments. So if it starts with m dash, that, that bash script finds those and properly rsyncs them into the right locations for Puppet environments. Um, and that's it. And we restart because we run into flaky issues with the Puppet master not pulling in uh, Ruby changes, which is acceptable. Just restart it. And note, I don't use Puppet environments for dev because I like to keep the production Puppet Master just for production. So I don't have a ton of Puppet environments. There's, for the production, for the production uh, Puppet Master, I have, I have production and staging, and that's it. Um, instead, for each developer or each environment other than staging, we use a new Puppet Master each time, usually on a smaller instance. Um, because the automated Puppet Master setup is so easy, that you could do this. Okay, so then repeatable workflow. So we have all this stuff building up, and now I want the workflow of development, not just deployment, but actual development, a server creation, I want that all to be the same. Um, so we dev in VirtualBox, we, we stage in production EC2, but those black things, go ahead and just swap them out with whatever you guys use, and I want it the same across all of it for, for every role. Yeah, goal, the goal is the same workflow. And so this is actually funny because this part's in Ruby, so instead of fab, we use rake. But basically what we ended up working with is something that looks like this. So instead of doing vagrant ups directly or vagrant provisions directly, we, I wrapped it in a very, very thin thing, and we use rake. So when you want to launch a new server, it's rake launch. If you want to launch a new server in development, it's rake launch. If you want to launch a new server in staging, it's rake launch. If you want one in production, it's rake launch. When you want to destroy it, it's rake destroy. When we want to provision it, which is kick the puppet, it's rake provision. Um, and that's the same across everything. It doesn't matter that Vagrant is using VirtualBox and production is on EC2. Um, based on the environment name, it figures that out and um, does it. And uh, it's basically just a wrapper that shells out to Vagrant for Vagrant and then an AWS library for AWS. And it's that simple, but, but and it's probably like 100 lines. And by doing that, it's just a consistent workflow. So every developer coming in, um, if they know how to dev, they know how to work in production. It's like it's, they're done. They learned it all. Um, and this also hides some cruft. So the rake destroy will actually do a cert clean and deactivate on the Puppet Master too. So that's kind of nice. And I, I talked about how that's a pain point earlier, and that's gone in this case. OK, Golden Master box creation for development. This one's really interesting. Um, the problem is that Vagrant Up for a complete development environment can get pretty slow. So if you have a really complex environment, then Vagrant Ups can start to take, you know, just due to the provisioning part, um, 30, 45 minutes, and it becomes a lot less uh, um, instant provisioning and a lot less, you, you lose the disposable use case of Vagrant. You don't destroy as often because you realize if you destroy, then you're going to lose an hour of work waiting for it to come back up, um, and this is a problem. So. I like to take advantage of Puppet's item potence and Vagrant package. So um, what do I mean by take advantage of the item potence? Um, basically, I do a two-pass Puppet run for development. Things converge in one run, but I use two runs, and you'll see why, um, for development. So pass one is pre-package. It installs and configures software. After that, I Vagrant package the box out and then give that upload that to some internal network, which for us is S3. Um, pass two is when people run Vagrant up. It runs the same puppet config. Nothing changes. Um, but that puppet config just makes sure that you know, services are started properly um, and everything's running and maybe a little bit a different configuration. Um, but this one, since it doesn't have to install software, which is usually the slow part, this puppet run is like uh, 100 seconds, maybe 50 seconds. I don't know. Um, and Vagrant package takes the current VM and produces a distributable box. That's what it does. And the idea, you have to use a little bit different workflow around this. So you have to build some discipline around updating the base box. Um, for us, what it is is we treat the base box kind of like you treat um, when you're using code. So when you branch something off in Git, before you 
um, commit it back to master, you have to rebase against master to make sure your changes go in. Likewise, when you're working on something on code, you work on whatever version of the box you want to run your stuff, but before you commit back into Git, you have to make sure that you ran it on the latest base box that is available from ops. Um, and that's this example. So um, that's pretty nice. And that's pretty cool because if they're working on a long running branch, they don't need to worry about their, their infrastructure and their vagrant box changing underneath them. Developers don't. It, it stays the same until they decide to update it. Um, bonus points, put this in a CI. You could have your base boxes, Golden Masters coming out automatically for every push. Um, and that's it. So the really underlying message I have is automate everything. Don't settle for anything not automated. And you end up having things that are easy everywhere. Um, thank you. So I have three minutes for questions. Um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, could you go to the thing? Or you could, yeah. If you have questions, go to, they, want, they want you to go to the thing. So. Thing is uh, a microphone. So, so do you tie this into Jenkins and your CI infrastructure, and in including the base um, uh, box package? So we, I haven't gotten to the point where it's in a CI yet. Um, but the golden base box thing, um, I know a lot of, a lot being like two people that do it in CI, and it works really well. Um, but yeah, I want to, the CI infrastructure and testing this in a CI is the next big step. Any other questions? Cool. I think that's it then. Thank you.